Hi, I'm Tyler. Before I dive into my story, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. Living with my dad and my stepmom, Janet, along with her two kids was never easy, but things used to be at least bearable. My dad remarried two years ago, and at first Janet seemed okay, kind of distant, but fair. But as time passed, the difference in how she treated her kids versus me became more apparent. It started with small things, really. For dinner, her kids would get generous helpings of whatever was cooking, and I'd often get what felt like leftovers. Tyler, you're getting too big for your age. Gotta watch that diet, Janet would say with a strained smile. I didn't think much of it at first. I just shrugged it off, figuring maybe she was right. However, as Dad's hours at work got longer, Janet's control seemed to tighten around the house, especially around me. One evening, I came home from school, dropped my backpack by the sofa, and headed to the kitchen. Where do you think you're going? Janet blocked the fridge as I tried to grab a snack. Just getting some food. I'm starving, I replied, trying to keep my voice even. The snacks are for the kids. They have swim practice. You can wait for dinner. Her tone was dismissive, and she didn't even look at me while speaking. As the days turned into weeks, I felt a growing pit in my stomach, not just from hunger, but from the realization that this was my life now. My room became my refuge, where I could escape Janet's cold glares and harsh rules, but even there, I felt the weight of isolation pressing down on me. One evening, I tried to express how I felt to Dad during one of his rare moments at home. Dad, things are different when you're not here. I don't think Janet likes me very much. Dad, tired and distracted, barely glanced up from his papers. Tyler, Janet's doing her best. Give it some time. Things will get better. He didn't see the things I saw. He didn't feel the coldness in her voice or the sharpness of her words. Feeling more alone than ever, I retreated back to my room, the sound of their laughter echoing down the hall as I closed my door. Lying on my bed, I stared at the ceiling, wondering how long I could endure this. The hunger wasn't just in my stomach anymore, it was in my heart, a craving for the warmth and love that once filled this home before Janet. As I drifted off to a restless sleep, the idea of another day under Janet's rule loomed over me like a dark cloud, promising nothing but the same cold indifference and creeping isolation. Life at home took a darker turn when Janet installed locks on the fridge and pantry. It wasn't subtle or gradual. One morning, the kitchen was just off-limits to me unless Janet decided otherwise. From now on, she announced one Saturday, standing in front of the closed kitchen door, you need to earn your meals around here. I can't have you just taking what you want when you want. Her kids watched, silently munching on their breakfast. I stood there, bewildered, unsure how to earn something as basic as food in my own home. If you want to eat, you'll do extra chores. Mow the lawn, wash the cars, clean the garage. And if that's too much, you can always choose to give up your allowance, she continued, her voice devoid of warmth. The first week, I tried to keep up. I mowed the lawn until my hands blistered, washed both cars until they sparkled, and organized the garage so well you could eat off the floor. But when I asked for food, Janet just nodded towards a small plate on the counter, barely enough to fill me up for a few hours. I started hiding bits of food in my room. Crackers, apples, anything non-perishable I could grab quickly when she wasn't looking. My backpack, under my bed, inside old shoe boxes. I became a master at concealing food, but it was never enough. My body began to feel the effects. My clothes hung loosely and I had trouble concentrating in school. My grades, once a source of pride, started to slip. I couldn't focus my stomach rumbling louder than my thoughts during exams. Tyler, are you okay? My teacher, Mrs. Jensen, asked one day after class. I had flunked a test I should have aced. Yeah, I'm fine, I lied, avoiding her concerned eyes. I wasn't ready to admit how bad things had gotten, not even to myself. At home, every mealtime became a battlefield. Janet's rules grew stricter, and my attempts to navigate her demands became more desperate. You didn't finish washing the windows. No dinner tonight, she declared one evening, her words cutting through the kitchen silence like a knife. That night, 
as I lay in bed. My stomach ached not just from hunger, but from the stress of living in a home where I had to earn my right to eat. The loneliness was palpable, my thoughts swirling in a dark mix of despair and frustration. Each morning I woke up exhausted, dreading the day ahead. School offered no relief, as my dropping grades began to attract attention I didn't want. Tyler, you need to apply yourself more, one teacher commented, handing back a test marked with red. But how could I explain that it wasn't a lack of interest, but a lack of food that was pulling my grades down? As I trudged through each day, the weight of my situation felt increasingly unbearable. Janet's house no longer felt like home. It was a prison, and I was counting down the days until I could somehow find a way out. The days blended into a blur of exhaustion and hunger, but it was during a particularly difficult week that everything changed. I was slumped over my desk during history class trying to focus on the lesson. When Mrs. Jensen, my history teacher, paused mid-sentence and walked over to me, her presence snapped me out of my daze. Tyler, can you stay after class for a moment? Her voice was soft, filled with concern that I hadn't noticed from anyone in a long time. As the bell rang and my classmates hurried out, I lingered, apprehensive about the conversation that was about to unfold. Tyler, I've noticed you've been very tired lately and your grades have dropped significantly. Is everything okay at home? Mrs. Jensen asked, her eyes searching mine for the truth. The concern in her voice cracked the facade I'd been holding up. My voice trembled as I tried to muster a generic excuse, but the words felt heavy and hollow. It's nothing. I'm just not sleeping well. Mrs. Jensen sat down next to me, her expression serious. Tyler, if there's anything going on, you can tell me. It's important. The floodgates opened, and I found myself pouring out everything. The locks on the fridge, the rationed meals, the extra chores, and how Janet treated me compared to her own children. Mrs. Jensen listened intently, her face growing more worried with each detail. The next day, Mrs. Jensen made a call to Child Protective Services, CPS. Within hours, a social worker arrived at our school to speak with me. I recounted my story, showing them the faint bruises from the physical toll of the chores and my malnourished state. CPS acted swiftly, arriving at our home later that day. I was at school, but I heard about the visit later. Janet was taken by surprise, her usual composure slipping into defensive aggression as she tried to dismiss the allegations. What nonsense! He's just a lazy boy making up stories because he doesn't want to do his chores! Janet snapped at the social worker. However, the evidence was hard to ignore. The locks on the pantry and fridge, my sparse bedroom with hidden stashes of food, and my physical appearance were more than enough for CPS. When my dad was called in from work, he was shocked. Confronted with the situation, his initial disbelief turned into horror as the reality of what had been happening under his own roof sank in. I had no idea I... His voice broke as he looked at me, seeing me not just as his son, but as a victim of the person he had trusted. The betrayal hit him hard. CPS facilitated a tense discussion where Janet's actions were laid bare. My dad was torn between his wife and his son, but the evidence was undeniable. He made the decision to remove Janet from our lives. The divorce proceedings began quickly, and Janet was required to move out. The emotional turmoil for my dad was immense. He was racked with guilt for not seeing the signs earlier, and for allowing his work to blind him to the reality of our home life. We moved out of the house temporarily taking refuge in a small apartment while we dealt with the legal and emotional fallout. As we sat in our new living room, a much smaller and humbler space than we were used to, Dad turned to me, his eyes filled with tears. I'm so sorry, Tyler. I should have been there for you. We'll get through this together. The promise of healing was a faint light at the end of a very dark tunnel, but for the first time in months I felt a glimmer of hope. We were free from Janet's control, and though the road ahead was uncertain, it was a road we would travel together. We started family therapy the second week in our new place. The therapist was a kind woman named Dr. Ellis, who had a gentle way of coaxing out words we'd both been afraid to say. It's about rebuilding trust, she told us during one session. Trust in each other 
and in yourselves. In therapy, we unpacked everything. I talked about the nights of hunger, the desperation, and the loneliness, while Dad shared his guilt and his struggle to balance work with family. It was painful revisiting those moments, but with each session, it felt like we were mending something broken. Slowly, life began to find a new rhythm. I re-enrolled in school, and with regular meals and less stress, my health and grades improved. My teachers noticed the change, and Mrs. Jensen even dropped by once with a stack of books she thought I'd like. Just a little fuel for that brilliant mind, she'd said with a wink. Dad cut back his hours at work to be more present. We'd cook together, fumbling over recipes and laughing at our culinary disasters. It was in these small moments, these attempts at normalcy, that I began to see the father I had missed during those dark days. We also started a new tradition, Sunday walks in the park. Just Dad and me, sometimes in silence, sometimes talking about everything and nothing. It was during one of these walks that Dad stopped, looked me in the eyes, and said, Tyler, I know I can't change the past, but I promise you this, I will never let you go through anything like that again. We're in this together. It wasn't an instant fix. Some days were harder than others, and the shadows of the past sometimes crept in, chilling the air between us. But we faced them together, a father and his son, rebuilding the bridges that had almost burned down. Looking ahead, I know there are still challenges to face and wounds to heal, but I feel hopeful. For the first time in a long time, I believe in the possibility of a future where the pain of the past is just a memory, a lesson learned on the journey to becoming stronger. As I share this story, I hope it reaches someone who needs to hear it, that you're not alone, and there's always a path to healing, no matter how broken the road might seem. Thanks for listening. If this touched you, or you know someone who might benefit from hearing it, please like and subscribe for more stories like this. Together, we can support each other and rebuild, stronger than ever. Now the story is over. I will turn this story into a video and upload it to my YouTube channel. I want to ask my followers a question from within the story that encourages them to interact and share their opinion. You can also gently encourage them to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Point out that the story has ended. Then start asking directly without introductions to ensure that followers are attracted before they leave. And then gently invite them to interact and subscribe to our channel. Always try to make the question deep and controversial in order to get the highest interaction.